Uh, yeah, so I want to tell you uh, how to remove graded encodings or multilinear maps from uh, functional encryption. And this is uh, joint work with uh, Rachel Lin and uh, Omer Panef. So let me start by turning on my clicker and then recalling how, uh, what, what exactly is functional encryption. So in plain encryption, we know that anyone that has the public key can encrypt. And if you don't have the secret key, you can't really tell an encryption of one uh, plain text from an encryption of the other. Um, and if you have the secret key, then of course you can fully learn the plain text. In functional encryption, you can also generate partial decryption keys that allow you to learn a specific function of the plain text. And we still require that indistinguishability holds, provided that the function doesn't separate these two plain texts. The function agrees on the two uh, plain texts. So this is the, the notion of functional encryption. And uh, as it turns out, uh, a crucial um, aspect that, that tremendously affects the, the power of functional encryption is what is exactly the size of the ciphertext and how it scales with the circuit size of the functions that you want to support. So let me tell you what is the rough picture here. Um, so we basically know that if we allow the size of ciphertext to grow with the, the circuit size of the functions that we want to support, then functional encryption is not really more powerful than plain encryption. And in particular, we can construct it from standard assumptions. In contrast, if we allow the ciphertext to even mildly grow with the circuit size, where my, by mild I mean that, say, sublinearly in the, in the circuit size, then, sorry, not mildly grow, but mildly be succinct, be mildly succinct, uh, then there's a tremendous jump in the power of functional encryption, and we already get uh, the immense power of obfuscation. Okay, so this is the, the, the power of, uh, of succinctness. And let me also mention that sometimes there's another measure of succinctness that we care about, which is how the size of ciphertext scales with the number of keys. Um, everything that I'm going to say today applies also there. For the sake of this talk, we can think about one key and we really care about how the ciphertext scales with the size of, uh, of the corresponding function. Okay, so... Naturally, uh, there's been a lot of work, and uh, uh, this has become constructing succinct functional encryption has become uh, a central goal in uh, cryptographic uh, research. Uh, and there's been some impressive uh, progress here, so let me tell you what we, we know roughly. So the first constructions were based on obfuscation, on uh, indistinguishability obfuscation. Uh, and then following that uh, were works that showed that you can actually construct functional encryption directly from um, multilinear maps or graded encodings. Today, the difference is not really going to matter. I'll say multilinear maps, uh, and even from, uh, from pretty uh, simple assumptions. Now, multilinear maps is, of course, an object that we still don't really understand well. And um, there's been a lot of effort in trying to sort of reduce the gap between multilinear maps and standard assumptions or objects that we understand better, and concretely bilinear maps. And today, sort of the, the state of the art constructions seem to come very close. We even have constructions based on uh, uh, trilinear maps uh, and some, uh, some simple assumptions on, uh, on local uh, PRGs. Uh, but we haven't quite crossed this line yet. We're still not in the, the world of, of standard assumptions. Certainly uh, uh, not, um, we don't have constructions that are based on bilinear maps. So let me tell you uh, what we do in, uh, in this work uh, for now at a, at a very high level. So we identify certain sufficient conditions uh, that will allow us to really cross this line and go uh, to bilinear maps, roughly speaking, what we show is that you can take any functional encryption scheme that uses constant degree uh, maps 
and sort of reduced the degree to two, to bilinear maps, provided two things. So first, we want the functional encryption scheme to be sufficiently succinct. And I'll say exactly what this means in a second. And second, we want the functional encryption scheme, the, the construction, to use the multilinear maps in a black box way. And here, when I say uh, black box way, I mean that the construction only makes generic operations. Uh, it doesn't really care. It's completely oblivious of the, the actual representation of these bilinear maps. So this is very similar to the generic group model that, that many of you probably uh, know. OK, so let me try to be more precise here uh, about what we show. What we show is the following. We show that you can take any uh, functional encryption scheme that uses a degree d uh, multi map as a black box and has succinctness that is better than 1 over d. Namely, the size of the ciphertext scales with the circuit size to the power at most 1 over d. And if we have that, plus other standard assumptions like uh, LWE, then we can get uh, a 16 functional encryption from bilinear maps. Now, uh, in terms of, of security, we're trying to uh, capture a, a large class of, uh, of constructions here. So basically what we want to start with is any functional encryption scheme that can be shown secure uh, in, in an ideal uh, generic multi map model. And as a result, also what we get is a construction that is secure in an ideal bilinear model. OK, so this is the, the result. And exactly how close that does it really bring us to, to constructing uh, functional encryption and, and obfuscation from, uh, from standard assumptions? So we're not quite there yet. So if you look at the existing constructions that we have, then first, we're definitely black box in the multilinear maps. We do have constructions of functional encryption that use multilinear maps as a black box, but we're not quite succinct enough. OK, so the succinctness is just over this 1 over d uh, term and is not sufficient for what we need in order to cross this line to bilinear maps. Uh, so this sort of really draws a, a very fine line between what we want and what we currently have. Um, and you can view it positively, as you know, there's a specific goal that you can try to achieve if you want to cross this line, that is, make our constructions more succinct. But of course, there's the flip side. You can also view this as a lower bound, perhaps, as a negative result that says, what are the limits of these functional encryption schemes that, that we're constructing? In particular, making them very succinct should be hard. How hard is hard as constructing obfuscation from bilinear maps? So this is about the, the interpretation. And for the, the remaining time, I would like to give you a, a taste of the, the ideas involved uh, in this uh, result. So the, the starting point is, is really a result for obfuscation by Passan Shalat that shows that in this case, if we have a, a construction of indistinguishability obfuscation, I.O., that uses constant degree maps in a black box way, you can actually completely remove the multilinear maps. We don't really add any power. Now, we have this result, and uh, you know, I just mentioned that if you have succinct functional encryption, then you can actually uh, construct from it I.O. So it may be tempting to think that this might even uh, already give us the result in the sense that perhaps we can take a functional encryption scheme that uses uh, multilinear maps as a black box way, use the existing transformations to get corresponding I.O., and then again remove them using existing results. Uh, the reason that this doesn't really work is that, quite interestingly, the reduction between I.O. and functional encryption is not a black box reduction. So even if you start from a functional encryption scheme that uses multilinear maps as a black box, the resulting 
I.O. scheme that you'll get will actually make use of the explicit representation of the code of these multilinear maps. So we have to do something else here. And, and roughly speaking, what we're going to do is we're still going to take a, a pretty similar route, at least uh, in spirit. But rather than thinking about I.O., we're going to think about a relaxed notion of obfuscation that is called uh, X.I.O., exponentially efficient um, X.I.O. And for this notion, we do actually have, there is an existing reduction from 16 function encryption to this relaxed notion of X.I.O. that is completely black box. In particular, it relativizes if we start with function encryption that uses Multilinear maps as a black box will get XIO that uses multilinear maps as a black box. And then most of the effort in this work is dedicated to, show, to showing that uh, if you have such XIO, then you can really reduce the degree of the multilinear maps and go to bilinear maps. So we won't be able to completely remove them as in the setting of IO, but we'll reduce them to bilinear. And then once you have XIO, then again, there exist reductions, even black box reductions, that will take you uh, uh, back to succinct function encryption and everything you need in order to get indistinguishability obfuscation. So this is sort of the, the blueprint. And uh, let me tell you now what exactly is XIO, what does it mean, uh, and how can we reduce the degree of multilinear maps in XIO. So, Usually when we want to uh, obfuscate, we have a circuit, and this circuit typically corresponds to a much larger truth table. If you write the circuit on each one of the, the values, the truth, label, the truth table will be much larger than the circuit itself. And uh, usually when we obfuscate the circuit, we expect that the resulting obfuscation is roughly the same size, maybe up to some polynomial blow-up. This notion of exponentially efficient XIO allows the obfuscated circuit not only to grow with the circuit size, but also to mildly grow with the size of the truth table. Okay? Say, sublinearly in the truth table. So it really seems like a much, uh, much uh, weaker uh, notion. Uh, in particular, for it to be applicable, we should think about circuits that compute a polynomially large Truth table, but perhaps this polynomial could be huge, much larger than the circuit uh, itself. And uh, it turns out that it's still very powerful. In particular, if you have this uh, notion under additional standard assumptions, you can, again, get all the way uh, uh, to 16 function encryption and, uh, and IO. Okay, so now we're going to try and show that if we have XIO, using multilinear maps as a black box, we can reduce their degree. And to understand how we do this, I would like to explain uh, in a very oversimplified way how this is done in the case of I.O., not the relaxed version, but the actual version uh, of I.O. And I'll say how you can reduce, say, from degree D, for some constant D, to linear maps, okay? basically discrete uh, log groups. Um, and concretely, I'm going to assume that such an obfuscation scheme has a very simple structure. It basically consists of a bunch of ring elements, x1 up to xm, uh, and these elements are encoded using the, our uh, multilinear uh, uh, groups. And all that you can basically do with these elements is perform certain zero tests given by degree d polynomials. Okay, this is all that you can do. In particular, in order to evaluate the obfuscation on specific inputs, you just compute certain uh, uh, zero test polynomials, test whatever uh, uh, zero, and this is also all that the attacker can do. Now, if you have such an obfuscation, how would you remove the, the or reduce the degree of the multilinear map? So one thing that you can do is rather than actually encoding all of these ring elements, you can sort of pre-compute all the monomials of degree at most d. Right? This is the only thing that is going to be relevant here. 
And instead of encoding them, it's just encode these monomials directly. Okay? And now, we don't really have to, uh, in order to perform these, uh, these tests, you don't really have to evaluate degree D polynomials. You can really evaluate linear polynomials in these new encoded, uh, in these new encoded elements. Now, why does this work? Why is this construction even efficient? So the reason that it's efficient is that there aren't too many monomials. Okay? There are m to the d monomials, where m is the number of encodings, and d is the degree of the, of the polynomials that we're trying to handle. And overall here, m is proportional to the circuit size. This is an obfuscation, after all. So overall, we have polynomially many encodings. Remember that d is a constant here. Okay. Now, say that you would try to do the same with XIO. We don't have IO at our disposal. Would this still work? So you can still write all of these monomials, but the problem is that now this is sort of trivial. And the reason is that in XIO, remember the size of the obfuscation, in particular the number of encoding, doesn't only scale with the circuit size, but also with the truth table. Okay? And it may, be, it may very well be much larger than, say, the truth table to the 1 over d, which means that m to the d is really just too much. It would completely trivialize this construction. The obfuscation would become as large as the entire truth table. So we can't really uh, uh, do this. And what we're going to do is instead rely on a somewhat stronger notion of XAO, uh, that has an additional decomposability feature. And it says the following. It says that now the obfuscation basically looks as follows. It's, just, it's not just a, uh, a list of encodings. It's, it's, it's a list, but now you, it can be divided into blocks, into uh, several blocks with, with two properties. So first, each of these blocks is going to be very small, so perhaps all the encoding scale with the truth table, but each of these blocks is very small for the sake of this talk, let's say, polynomial in the circuit size. And moreover, this, the relevant zero test, so whenever you try to evaluate an input, you only have to evaluate polynomials that are very local. Very local in the sense that they only touch, say, two blocks in this list. Now, we're going to use this decomposable XIO, and fortunately, uh, you can also uh, show that the existing constructions that we have of XIO from functional encryption, those black box constructions, really do have this decomposability feature. And how can you use this decomposability feature in order to reduce the degree? Now, instead of simply uh, encoding all the monomials, we're going to encode the monomials corresponding to each block separately. Okay, so the blocks are not um, too big. And uh, the point is that now, if you look at these uh, polynomials, since they're very local, they only touch two blocks, then we can, we can really rewrite them as bilinear polynomials, as degree two polynomials in these new encoded monomials. So we managed to reduce the degree from whatever constant d that we had to 2. And again, the size, since each block is now very small, raised to some constant, overall the, the size is controlled, and we still get the compression that XIO has to guarantee. Good. So this is really the, the rough idea. There's much more uh, going under the hood. This was uh, really uh, over... Uh, Simplified, um, I won't uh, give you the details. You can, uh, you can uh, read them in the, the paper or ask me uh, offline. Let me just mention uh, two additional results that, uh, that we have in the, the paper. So um, what we said doesn't really say anything about, say, uh, the generic group model or the random oracle model. Models that are weaker than the bilinear models, can we remove such oracles from uh, functional encryption? And we do show such uh, complementing uh, results, both for the generic group model and for the random oracle model. But here we need to assume a slightly uh, stronger notion of unbounded uh, key functional encryption. And the, no 
very equivalent to, to 16 function encryption in the, in the world of non-black box reductions, but in the world of black box reductions, we don't really know that they're uh, equivalent. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to say, and I'll just remind you that, that this challenge is still open, basically. Still don't really know how to go to bilinear maps from standard assumptions. This is a very uh, active uh, area, so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to see uh, what comes uh, next year. So, thanks. <laughs>